Francis Coppola used his legendary powers of persuasion and a bit of lucky timing to secure the financing his budding empire required. The regime at Warner Brothers had changed, and I tried to parlay the Rain People um, thing into them sponsoring George's film, which was THX 1138, and then some of the other fellas. Francis said, uh, well, we have to turn your script in because we were finishing things. So I turned THX in. It got rejected. So Francis said, well, we'll forget about that. They're being bought out. He said, so what we'll do is we'll wait until these new guys come on board. We won't tell them that this has already been turned down. We'll just pretend like we've already started it. Luckily, Hollywood was anxious to be in the Francis Coppola business. Francis was a gifted man. We all knew it. Uh, he had a number of interesting things, not the least of which was the media screenplay of uh, Apocalypse Now. And George Lucas, who everybody thought was extraordinary, all that knew him felt that he was a sort of potential cinema genius, certainly revolutionary. The day that John Calley and Ted Ashley and all those guys showed up for work, their first day at work at the, this new Warner Brothers Seven Arts, Francis sent him a note which said, you know, we have a picture in production here, and we're here waiting for your go-ahead, and you better shape up or ship out. And that's really where American Zotrop started, because they called back and they said, well, we don't know what this is all about. We have, you know, we aren't, we're just getting, we're just moving into our offices here. But why don't you come down next week and tell us what, what this American Zotrop is and what this movie THX is all about. We bought the, the notion that uh, we would help subsidize Zoetrope. They would work out of uh, San Francisco that the paradigm would be one of modestly uh, budgeted films done in a hands-off manner, that Francis would be the parental figure, at least as he presented it, and, uh, and that we would say yes and wait. Francis, you know, was given money by Warner Brothers to start Zotro, probably because of the making these movies like Easy Rider and stuff, you know, and, and they said, well, we have to make some youth movies too. We have a youth here, you know, we have Francis Copley, he has a beard, he knows hippies, you know, he knows all these scruffy characters. I remember I was having an open casting call when he came back, he went down to L.A., he came back, and he came into this casting call, they had you know, actors lined up for days in this, in this theater. And uh, he came down the hall with all the actors waiting in their chairs to come in and see me. And he came and he said, George, I gotta tell you, we succeeded. Not only did I get THX off the ground, but I got six other movies off the ground. Uh, I even got that film that you and John are working on, the Apocalypse Now, I got that off the ground too. I got seven movies, the magic number for him. And, uh, and I gotta go ahead to do THX, we're on our way. And they're gonna fund American Zotro. And that was like the very, that was the, the moment that American Zotrop was really born. I think Francis always looked at George like his sort of upstart assistant who had an opinion. An assistant with an opinion, nothing more dangerous than that, right? The two men who founded American Zoetrope shared a common vision, but the differences between Francis Coppola and George Lucas revealed themselves as the fledgling company took shape. These two guys are as far apart from one another as, as you can possibly get, I think, in, in terms of personality. You can drop Francis in the middle of the darkest jungle in Africa without any knowledge of anything, and two days later, he'll have control of everything where he's at. I mean, he's just one of those kind of guys. I think George realized that Francis was a good front man. Let Francis go in and, and do all the stuff with Hollywood and, and so forth, and I'll just make my movie. I'm very cautious. I don't borrow money. I'm very protective of the things that I build. I build a pyramid from the wide part to the narrow part. Francis builds it from the narrow part to the wide part. And uh, that's the difference between the two of us. Uh, when we're together, it's great, because you've got two pyramids sitting next to each other, and it makes a big square. Well, we're about as opposite as we could be. I mean, George's strengths are, without a doubt, in areas of editing and design and cinematic conception. And, my strengths were more working with actors and writing. What I was really good at, George was less good at, and what he was really good at, I was less good at. George was working on something and made a wisecrack to Francis, and Francis went into this aria about how is it possible I'm the only one with any vision around here. Even though they sort of realized that they were not at all alike, that's what interested them about the other. George would say, oh, that's Francis, and, and, and Francis would say, well, you know what George is like. And the interesting thing for me was that 
I felt that they both had a tremendous amount of respect for each other. Francis's life is dedicated to success and succeeding. Even contemplating failure isn't something he thinks about. He doesn't look at the downside. I'm always looking at the downside. And he's calling me, oh, you're just an old putz. You're an 80-year-old kid, he used to say. And again, I was like, what, 25 years old? And he said, why are you always worried about everything going wrong? Why don't you just think about all, all the success we're gonna have? You know, and you go and you jump off a cliff. It's France, you're gonna get killed. Oh, we are always worrying about everything. And then you'd sort of land in a perfect pirouette and say, see, it's no problem. It was like running away with a circus to be with Francis and to join American Zotron. With Warner Brothers funding in hand, Francis Coppola set about finding the writers to create the seven scripts he'd already sold to the studio. He sold seven because that was his lucky number, but he didn't actually have seven scripts. He said, I've got some friends, and you call your friends, and we'll do these screenplays. As he would throughout his career, Lucas tapped his film school friends to help out. So when George said, you know, I want you to meet Francis, you know, it sounded wonderful. It sounded like a, a dream. I remember the first meeting I had with Francis. I sat down, he said, I've read this script. I think it's really great. It's the kind of thing American Zoetrop wants to make. And uh, he opened his drawer and he said, and I've got a contract for you, you know, to join us. I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, it's a contract to write and, and direct six movies. Willard Hike would be joined by fellow USC alumni Matthew Robbins and Hal Barwood, John Milius, and Caleb Deschanel. Bob Dalva came aboard to head up the company's commercial division. From UCLA came Coppola's old friend and rival, Carol Ballard, along with documentarian Steve Wax. It was a crazy group. You know, it was, went from sort of ultra-radical Marxists to people that were doing TV commercials. <laughs> You had carpenters building American Zoetrope, but half of them were high on acid, you know, while they were doing it. With seven projects in development and a stable of ambitious young filmmakers anxious to get started, Coppola and his team set about turning the Folsom Street warehouse into a home. Zoetrope was in this dark building down in a very kind of rough area. We had essentially the second floor of the building and there were three corner offices. It was Francis, George, and myself. And in the middle was a, the mixing room theater. And it was marvelous. You went in there, and here was all this equipment. I mean, you couldn't believe how much equipment was there. There was the greatest sound studio, better than any in Hollywood, you know. There were the newest editing machines. We arrived in San Francisco when they were demolishing the old Fox movie theater, which was a fantastic movie palace on Market Street and Francis bought the exit doors to the Fox Theater, and those were the entrance doors to uh, this 827 Folsom Street. True to his style, Francis set up a pool table and an espresso machine. <laughs> I like to believe, you know, fantasize that he had the first cappuccino machine in a, in a film company anywhere in the world. It was all very utopian kind of thing, and my wife uh, helped decorate it. I had a lot of fun. I. It was that period in the 60s where lots of colors, I mean, some of the walls had like diagonal orange and white stripes. My little boy was, you know, with the hammer, I have films of him helping us build the studio. So it, it was really the first facility of a group of young filmmakers in America, which later became the prototype of every commercial house and every uh, effects house in LA and all over the world. I think more than anything, it was an extension of all of our experiences in film school. It was like a dream. It was like the film school that never existed. It was a student's dream come true. The range of Zoetrope's projects was emblematic of the diverse company Coppola and Lucas envisioned. Besides THX 1138, there was Willard Hike's comedy The Naked Gypsies, Coppola's dark and brooding The Conversation, a drama by John Corti entitled Have We Seen the Elephant? Carol Ballard's Vesuvia, Santa Rita, Steve Wax's study of the People's Park riots in Berkeley, and Apocalypse Now, which was, at the time, a project intended for George Lucas to direct. 
the closest we came to the dream was when we were doing THX and everybody was writing their scripts. Everybody was hanging out at the pool table drinking cappuccinos and waxing philosophically about the new world order and everything. I think the greatest thing was just people just didn't censor their ideas. So you just sort of, we just sort of go along and do things and have a, a great deal of fun just sort of experimenting. We used to have these parties and we'd dance and drink and carry on. And, you know, in the middle of the party, somebody would show up. And one, one time, Kurosawa showed up, you know. I mean, it was fantastic. Suddenly, it was the grand opening of American Zoetrope, and so we had a party. On December 12th, 1969, it opened up these facilities, which were, you know, to young people, it had never been seen before. Francis threw this rather elaborate party and, and had put the cameras out, you know, the Eclair cameras. There was about a thousand people, a lot of whom were from Los Angeles. Francis being the gregarious guy that he is, the carpenters who, you know, had built the place and everybody else, you know, was invited. So it wasn't like some little effete affair. It was teeming with people. Everyone came, all of the rock groups and Graham and Ken Kesey came to our party. At that party, you could go around to different floors and all kinds of things were going on. There was a lot of dope being smoked. A lot of alcohol, a lot of alcohol. A lot of sex. It was great. There was a lot of dope around. George wasn't smoking dope. Francis wasn't doing any dope, you know? A lot of people weren't doing any dope. Walter Murch, et cetera, et cetera. I can't quite say this, exactly the same thing. And John Calley, who is the, the, the new mocker at Warner Brothers and, uh, and Freddie Weintraub, flew up. And they kind of stood there with their hands in their pockets, I remember, sort of half off on the side. The opening party served as a bold announcement that filmmaking was no longer restricted to Los Angeles. San Francisco, with the most vital counterculture in America, embraced the company with open arms. It felt as though we had connected with a wellspring of creativity, all that had to do with the music and the hippie world and, you know, the flower children and the political foment. That was all there in, in San Francisco, and everybody was interested in film, and here were all these kind of young guys who built this whole film studio, so it was, it was like a magnet. I just don't think that you can separate the filmmaking experience that everybody's going through from the politics that were going on at the time. Vietnam was a like a, a low-grade fever that had been burning since the late 50s, early 60s, and it was about to become a full-blown pneumonia in 66, 67, right when we were uh, gradu all graduating from film school. And there was always a potential of people being drafted and you know going to war because in those days they had the draft and um, I mean there are probably a certain amount of people who were in school to avoid the draft. Nobody ever talked about Vietnam on a, on a soundstage. It was the darndest thing. We talked about it a lot on campus when I was going to college. It was it was the it was the only thing anybody ever talked about because we were all of draft age and we were struggling to stay in school to keep our 2S deferments. The war was was a major feature of our lives. So it also gave a desperation that, you know, people would try to do things, make, you know, say, well, I'm only going to make films probably while I'm here. You know, I'll be killed next year or something. The nature of uh, questioning the country and then accusing uh, the administration's behavior and then feeling resolutely, uh, feeling resolved against it, um, it was something to make you try anything then on film. You break all the rules. Both. George and I were very, very much not political. We were surrounded by all kinds of political factors. I once went into Francis's uh, uh, living room. We had a picture of Mao Zedong. I said, what is a capitalist like you having a picture of Mao Zedong? He walked away. I remember there was a guy, and he was, um, he was a communist and a dedicated communist, and Francis had picked him. And Francis had a big car. I don't remember what, it was before the big Mercedes, but he had a big car. And the guy came up and he said, why, why should you have that car? And Francis says, well, it's my car. He says, but that means you're just one of the bosses, aren't you? You know, you're just, you're just no different than J.P. Morgan or any other capitalist who's exploiting us. And this whole political 
you know, discussion ensued. And of course, Francis, being a good leftist, had to listen to this until he finally got angry. He said, it's my car, I own this place, and I'm going to drive in my car because I am the big guy here. I'm the big shot. You're not the big shot. I'm the big shot. You can call it whatever you want or get out. And that was that. Rather than allow his studio to become a tool of any particular political agenda, Coppola focused his charismatic energy on turning his dream of a filmmaking utopia into reality. Francis spun his dreams of glory for all of us. It was quite hypnotic. Francis loved playing the impresario the, and essentially the godfather of the setup, you know. I remember he took us to a closet and he'd been stealing short ends from the making of Finian's Rainbow. And he says, look at all the film I have. He says, film is power. He says, if you have enough film, all you need is a camera then, and I have one of those too. I can do anything I want. And oh, it was just wonderful. It was very heady stuff, you know. And, and we were willing to, you know, to die at his side. Young filmmakers would arrive with their, with their films, and uh, Francis was always willing and able and happy to look at uh, somebody's film. His door was open to any young film student anywhere in the world. You can just walk in and meet Francis. It was just great. He was, he was just open and encouraging and, and, and himself inspirational. And some of the most wonderful memories were, was about going up to Francis Coppola's house, with him, being with his family, cooking uh, food, uh, helping him cook, making gnocchi at night, him, and him spouting out all these uh, ideas and also, uh, also, uh, making sure that you kids have to understand one thing, you and George, you can't mess around with genre. You have to follow us. No, no, we want to change it. You're not, it has to remain the same. He was quite right in a certain way. I just remember having a story meeting with Francis about our script, and he just really did a dissection of how this didn't work, and that didn't work, and that didn't work, and uh, I was in a uh, swirl of confusion and despair because the idea that something didn't work, that <laughs> I couldn't understand how that were possible. It was like master classes being up there, listening to him also wheel and deal, you know, work with studio executives. I, I feel like I'm on the verge of saying, fellas, all jump in the lake, I'm going to make the movie now, unless you can get the police to come and stop me from shooting, because I don't need Warner Brothers. I mean, Warner Brothers can, can waltz out on the deal, and I've got the money to make the film. He was very tough, and he was very strong, and he said, you, you have to want to make a film so strongly that you would kill for it. And I knew what he meant. George pursued a very independent vision with THX, and uh, creatively, I think he really achieved something. With the company finally on its feet, American Zoetrope geared up to produce its first feature film, George Lucas's uncompromising vision of the future, THX 1138. Once THX actually was a go, then we actually were able to pay people, and you know everybody suddenly was had a job. But before that, nobody had a job. In fact, Lucas had begun prepping the film even before the deal with Warner Brothers had closed. In that meantime, while we were waiting for Seven Arts to take over Warner's, you know, I was interviewing cameramen, uh, we were scouting locations. We were actually starting the movie. We had no funding whatsoever, and the film had been turned down by the studio already. Filming began on September 23, 1969. Ironically for Lucas, the experience wasn't that different from film school. You know, we didn't have much money in there. Therefore, there was a lot of issues of, you know, trying to do everything on a shoestring. The financing on THX was um, always a little iffy because you never knew if it, you're going to be able to shoot the next day. You know, getting into locations, you know, we sort of just barely get into them, and sometimes we get into a location for like two hours, and that's all we had to shoot the movie with. And so there was a lot of things where we sort of, you know, like a street film, we were sort of getting in there, getting our shots before the police came, and then running. It was guerrilla style. They took opportunity of the fact that BART, the subway system, was being built. They found modern locations that were just parts of buildings. I think for George, the shooting of THX was a good experience because it modeled in many ways the kind of filmmaking we were used to, small unit, alternate subject matter, not traditional storyline, not traditional characters, people didn't have names. It was a, an attempt, uh, a noble attempt, to uh, bring that kind of a spirit to the big screen and get it into distribution. George was battling the idea of lighting. He didn't want to lose time. 
He wanted to get through the day. He wanted to make it work without all that nonsense. It was part of the establishment to him that you had to use lighting and makeup and go through all, you know, and have all these extra people. Despite his lack of experience, by all accounts, Lucas made a smooth transition to feature film directing. George was a natural, knew what he wanted. He didn't have to prove his leadership or his knowledge. He was very soft-spoken. His actors knew exactly uh, where they were going and why. Actors say to each other, what kind of director is he? They say, well, he leaves you alone, you know, and, and that's always a welcome thing. I mean, when you need help, you need help, obviously. But you felt you were in safe hands for such a young guy. THX 1138 wrapped production on November 12, 1969. Rather than work in the maelstrom of Zoetrope's Folsom Street warehouse, Lucas and his sound editor Walter Murch repaired to the tiny attic of Lucas's house in Mill Valley to begin post-production. All this other craziness was going on over south of Market, and I wasn't, you know, I kind of stayed as far away from that as I could because it was just way too crazy for me, and I was trying to make my movie. Worked in the attic of my house. Walter would work uh, at night. I would cut stuff during the day. So he would be finishing up at I don't know, 9 o'clock at night, and I would then arrive and take the film away and start syncing up the, my sound effects to it. And then over dinner, his, uh, his breakfast, my dinner, we would talk about what I'd cut during the day and what I thought, you know, where we, I thought the soundtrack would go and what we were doing, and then he would spend the whole night cutting sound. The clatter of film was heard 24 hours a day. 